Hello, this is Jerry DiPiano, and you are listening to, or possibly viewing, the Love Mia Vita podcast. Today, our guest is Dr. Juliana Hauser. Dr. Juliana has been our guest on a number of different podcasts, and we're so happy to have her back again. Juliana, please, please share a little bit about your background with our audience. Thank you. I'm so happy to be back. I um, So I hold two licenses. Um, one is uh, I'm a marriage and family therapist, and I'm also a licensed professional counselor, and I have my doctorate in counseling education. And then I have an area of expertise within sex, sexuality, and intimacy. I, um, I work with individuals and couples, and I teach courses um, in eight countries um, across the globe. Fantastic. So we always enjoy having Dr. Juliana join us because she is a sexpert. Uh, she's a psychologist, but she is a sexpert. And we all understand that sex and intimacy are very a very fundamental part of who we are. Um, and, and it's a big, it can be a big stressor and it can also be a source of immense joy at any age. But today we're actually going to speak on a topic that um, involves partners and how they navigate through the menopause transition, starting with perimenopause and progressing into the postmenopausal years. And by the way, we are not excluding a younger population. And let me explain why. So there may be a number of individuals who, for other reasons, because they have other conditions or other diseases or disorders, exhibit menopausal symptoms. I think in particular, we, we talk about members of the cancer community, women who have breast and ovarian cancer, who as a consequence of their treatment may experience some of the same symptoms of natural menopause. Sadly though, uh, when a woman is thrust into menopause due to malignancy, if she's not naturally in menopause and she is in chemical menopause or surgical menopause, those symptoms don't gradually appear. They may suddenly appear. So they may be sources of great frustration and concern, but there is help. And there are ways in which we can also navigate through some of the issues, particularly the intimacy issues, because we, we all understand that that is a big part of our enjoyment in life and sharing those moments with your partner um, if they're disrupted by these types of conditions and symptoms that are associated with them, can be very frustrating. They can cause depression and anxiety for both parties. So doc, Dr. Uh, Juliana, Juliana, let's talk about um, in early menopause and what 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 do you see when you're speaking with women who are just beginning the menopause transition? Maybe they're in perimenopause. Mm -hmm. So oftentimes I will hear a lot of fear, fear because the information that they have been given sounds awful and scary fear because no one can predict exactly how your own experience with perimenopause or menopause is going to progress, what symptoms you're going to have or not experience. And there's a lot of lack of information out there. So lots of, lots of unknowns that leads to fear for, for most people. The next what I see is I'm confused what's happening with my body and where are we finding it? For instance, I have a, a group of college friends that we have a you know, group text message and we, they, they'll, we, everyone's sending articles to each other or I have found this good physician and let's all start talking. And it was almost as if one person goes to a, uh, a medical appointment but everyone actually goes because everyone's submitted questions ahead of time. This one person's going to ask or they're disseminating the information that they found. And so it's a lot of our perimenopause and, and early menopause experiences is through community, um, grassroots uh, in a way. And we have to almost kind of fight for the right education and for helpful information, which to me is, and I know we've talked about this too, like it's unfortunate that that's how we, that we have to work so hard to get informed. But that's typically where I meet people at this phase is I'm afraid and I'm not sure, is this happening? And I think like here, here I am. Uh, and what, is, what does this mean for myself? I'll give another example. 
I was with um, another group of uh, college friends and we were mixed gendered. And it started off as those who were identified as women talking about aging and talking about menopause. Uh, and then uh, the other genders and men um, uh, got into the conversation and it was hilarious. I mean, we actually had a very a big laugh as it, especially when the men started joining in talking about their aging or their experience of their partners going through menopause. And it felt so beautifully normalizing. And, and what was also interesting was not one person had the same symptoms, not one. Everyone had different symptoms, and but everyone had similar questions of like, I mean, I don't know. That, that was the overall theme of it. So again, I think when I, when I meet people, it is I want to alleviate fears. I want to normalize the variance and also galvanize and empower each person to say, you, um, okay, so now you're on this journey. Uh, now it's time to take responsibility for what you're needing in this. And here's, here are your options. And the symptoms, you're, you're absolutely correct. The symptoms are oftentimes very confusing. So when we've conducted our research and our market research, what we, what we learn is that women might have irregular periods. They may have dysfunctional uterine bleeding. So sometimes they're bleeding excessively. Sometimes they're not seeing so much. And when it comes to their partners, uh, whether they are partnered with the same in a same sex relationship or even in um, in a heterosexual relationship, if there isn't clear communication, this is what's going on with my body. Even if they don't quite understand what's happening, there's nothing wrong with sharing with your partner that, hey, I I don't know what's going on. Maybe I'm in a menopause transition. Maybe I'm starting to exhibit symptoms of perimenopause because I have irregular periods. I'm, I'm bleeding often. I'm waking up in the in the middle of the night and I'm tearing my clothes off. And your partner might think, well, hey, we're going to have wild sex. But it's really, no, I'm just, you know, I'm boiling. I feel yes. like somebody had, you know, put a heating blanket on me and I, and, and I feel like I'm melting. So I'm ripping off my clothes because of this, or I'm shoving all the covers on, over to your side of the bed. So having that conversation with your partner Again, even if it's in a same-sex relationship, it doesn't mean that your same-sex partner is going through this at the same time that you are, or as you illustrated previously, could be that her symptoms are different than yours. Mm -hmm. So having that open dialogue, uh, that is super important. We also hear that when it comes to sex and intimacy, so we will see some uh, changes in the mood and maybe a function of what's going on with your pelvic and reproductive organs. It could be a function of what's going on with your gut that you're experiencing bloating or constipation or bladder issues. And so you may not feel like you want to have intercourse. So talk, let's talk about the, you know, the, the sexual component because that's a key and that's one of our, our key areas of interest. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll give an example um, that I'm going to put a, a couple of clients into, into one story, um, but this is very typical. So one symptoms that uh, in particular uh, uh, people don't understand as a part of perimenopause or menopause is that periods can become more frequent. And uh, so if, if partners are used to um, the woman having either like on birth control and so maybe never having periods or having very light periods, very regular periods, once they've hit menopause or perimenopause and they're off the pill or, um, or things are becoming more irregular, they're shocked to find out they could be getting their periods every two weeks, every two and a half weeks. They could um, be having bigger flows. And so in those conversations, I work, work with couples, there's often like a joking period of like, ah, I thought we were through that. We're back in high school again. And it's, it's, it's said in a flippant kind of way, in a joking kind of way, not in a malicious way, but also not understanding that the woman who's going through that is 10 times more upset about the experience and doesn't know how to say, like, I can't even consider being intimate right now when I just left a board meeting and I bled through my clothing and had to ask, like, I'm a 14 year old, do you have a, do you have a blazer or something to cover myself? And I'm sobbing in the bathroom thing, like, how am I here again? How, what do I do? 
And yet I'm, I'm supposed to be in this freeing period, time period, and be in the mood with you and wanting to do this when I'm, I'm at war with my body and I'm confused by what's happening with my body and I'm depressed and I'm sad and I'm scared. And I don't know if I have a partner that gets that. Now, usually when people come to me, it's because things have gotten, you know, to a further end of things. So I see lots of breakdown of communication, but it's one of the key elements of if you're wanting to really protect and keep your sexual intimacy um, agile to what's going on with a perimenopausal a menopausal body is you have to start with understanding that there are probably 10 things happening all at once. And you need to attend to that emotionally and take it all very seriously um, as a way of preserving, preserving the sacredness of that, of that sexual intimacy. The next thing you need to do is you need to start looking at different options of what does it mean to be sexually intimate. Uh, and that if penetration is off the table uh, for right now um, or any touching or anything that has to do uh, with your vulva or, or, or vaginal opening, then you can still find, it doesn't mean that intimacy has to be off the table. It just means penetration is for this time period. So become inventive, expand the definition of, of what that looks like. And uh, there are some studies that show that cuddling and making out and like really focusing on kissing um, actually brings up um, a lot of hormone, hormonal release and connecting than actually penetrative sex. And you mentioned uh, that you can get creative and you mentioned a symptom that women may begin to experience uh, during perimenopause. They may start to experiencing pain during intercourse mm -hmm. and it may feel uncomfortable to have that conversation with one's partner. We, we hear this all the time. We did in our market research and in our clinical research, we, we've heard it consistently for the 20 years that, that Fem Pharma has been doing uh, clinical research. And that can prompt women to stop having intercourse with their partners because it, the, of the fear of pain and, and why not? I mean, why, you know, why wouldn't that? If something hurts, you don't want to repeat the behavior. On the other hand, it can become a vicious cycle because the, the longer you avoid intimacy, the, the more the symptoms may become progressive and severe. Um, and the narrowing of the vagina makes things even worse. And the attempt by a partner to have penetrative sex is often met with, I'm not interested, they want resistance. So there, it, it can become very complicated, but having how to have that discussion with your partner. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's two ways. I have two ways I want to go, uh, go about that topic. One is when we start talking about communicating about our sexual selves, it unravels so many things that we, you know, that it, on, on this podcast, we're, we, we're not going to talk about, we've already talked about it, um, that we're talking about sexual messages. It's impolite to talk about it. So you have, the assumption is you have worked through that aspect too. And if you haven't, then that's what you need to start with. You need to start with feeling that this is a comfortable, appropriate, important thing to speak of. Um, the second is, is being comfortable with saying this is going on and I don't know why, or I don't know exactly how to explain it. Because sometimes we wait until we can succinctly explain it to our partner or we really understand it. And, and that isn't always the case. So just saying like, hey, I'm feeling this, I don't know what this means, or this isn't feeling good and I, and I want it to change. And then that leads us to like my, my favorite technique in communicating something that feels awkward or hard is to speak about it in the affirmative of what you want. So, um, and because oftentimes in the sexual communication uh, exchange, people feel criticized. So you may be saying to your partner, um, this is my body, like I know my body's hurting and something needs to change. Your partner hears, I'm doing something wrong. She's upset with me. This means we're not having sex anymore. And that's not at all what was being said. So starting off with, um, you know, our sex life is important to me and I have been avoiding this or I've been afraid of this lately, or I haven't told you it's hurt. 
And um, I need to tell you this because I want us to, to fix it. I want us to get help and support in that. Or I need your support in figuring this out. I'm scared um, to what this means. And it can be, it can be really, if you've never been told that uh, you could start experiencing pain because of hormonal changes or not having very, sex very often, it can feel very scary that it's something that's not fixable and something that is seriously wrong with you. Um, and so you want to express that kind of a range of emotion with that. So that's one aspect is that if it's you're the body, if you're the person that's having this, that you want to own those different, own your feelings about it, own your fears about it, and, and speak as to why this is important to you for the relationship. If you're a partner, I love when I can help a partner become proactive. So if you are somebody who's partnered with a body who's going to be going through menopause, then I really want to ask you to, to say like, hey, so let's have a menopause conversation. I've been looking up some things. Curious, any chance you're having pain during intercourse that I don't know about? Or do you think it's time if, if you aren't always using lube, although I hope people are. Um, like, I'm wondering if we should look at, uh, at using lubricant as like proactively in, in this process. How do you feel about it? Because sometimes even just a conversation about lubricant is loaded with a lot of messages within it that it's a failure or that it is something's wrong with you or broken instead of it being like, thank goodness, this amazing product exists for us. And it is enhancing our relationship and our experience rather than something that is like, oh, we got to hide it. And this is terrible that we have to use it. It's a beautiful thing. So if you can be a partner to a body who's using this and say, I want this for us. I've looked this up to let's get in this together with you and let's get ahead of these things. It's wonderful. It's beautiful. And it really helps normalize the experience as well. So uh, as a footnote to that, um, it's, you know, when we think about normalizing this, the just F, the FYI to this is the WHO, the World Health Organization, does encourage the use of personal lubricants, particularly the water-based personal lubricants. The, the reason is that if you are having penetrative intercourse and you're using, <clears throat> excuse me, a personal lubricant and vaginal moisturizer, you are protecting your vaginal tissue, uh, the epithelial tissue, that mucosal tissue, which is so easily torn. And it doesn't have to be because you're old or you're menopausal or somehow you're, there's something you said broken. You're not broken. But it, it, it is always encouraged because it protects those tissues and it reduces, reduces. It doesn't prevent, so still use a condom if you are having um, intercourse with a, an, in a relationship where you're not monogamous, but it does protect to some degree from the ability to transmit sexually transmitted infections. So you wanna, you wanna protect those mucosal surfaces. So it's not for old people. It's not just for old people. So let's throw that aside. And yes, that it, it's it's important. It's also um, what sometimes we hear from women. I think I have female sexual arousal disorder. Mm -hmm. And could that be the case? Could be the case, right? It probably requires a little bit more intervention from a professional like yourself to determine whether this is really about female sexual arousal disorder, or is it a function of, I am going through some menopausal changes. It has, sex has been hurting. And by the way, sometimes it's not just our vaginas that are hurting or our vulvas. Could be that you have breast tenderness. Breast tenderness doesn't just go away. So if the breast is one of your erotic zones and it hurts to have your partner touching your breasts, you may have some other painful symptoms and it's good to have this conversation with your partner because yes, your hormones are declining, but they haven't evaporated. So if you've had breast pain before menopause, although it may start to subside as your hormones decline, you may still experience some breast pain. So if your breasts are hurting and your pelvic and reproductive organs are hurting, or you have a little bit of bladder leakage, these are all things that we need to share with our partners. By the way, it doesn't matter. Again, if you have a same-sex partner, she may not be going through this at the same time or in the same way. Mm -hmm. She may be using some other way in which to address menopausal symptoms that may obviate 
some of what you're going through. Or if you are married to a heterosexual or involved in a partnership with a heterosexual individual, then he may be having his own experience with menopause, which may be he has insecurity because he's not getting the erection that he had in the past. And he feels, I can't satisfy my partner. That's why she's not lubricated. She's complaining about her breasts hurt, hurting. She's complaining about her vulva and vagina being dry. So what advice do you give couples when they come to you and he has issues, she has issues? And we use the heterosexual couple and then we could certainly use same-sex couples. I, I, I like to to start off, honestly, with a bit of humor, which is, isn't it a miracle we are able to even have sex at all? Like, isn't it? What do you think about all the things? It's just like, how does it, it's just a miracle, obviously, that, that a baby is made. It's also a miracle to have two people be able to get together and sexually connect one time and have it be good, let alone for many years, let alone add all the other things as a part of it. And it's just, it's just a miracle. So it's not surprising that we have complications as a part of it. And I just think that's so important for people to hear because often when they come to me, they're terrified. They're terrified, they're hopeless, they're angry, they're irritated. Uh, and and they, they people will often say, you are our last hope. And and that I, I don't want people to feel that way. So you have to go to the place of like, okay, we are not the only ones that go through this. And other people have figured this out and we can figure this out too. We just have to be inventive. We have to be able to be agile to the problem solving. And we have to be able to be honest and authentic with really what's going on with our bodies and emotionally. And um, and we, we need to, to be willing to risk take in um, and trying different things and looking at looking at the changes that we're having. Again, not as if we're broken, and that we are now in the lesser phase of our sexual life, we're just in a different phase of it. There are, and, and that's something also that I think has been such a miseducation for our, our generations is that your sex life declines for sure. It, it, defi it declines in, um, in fulfillment, it declines in frequency, and that's just not the case for everybody, it just isn't. Um, and, and so let's go into this thinking so what's now? So here we are and what's now for us? What are our options? And having some optimism as a part of it goes a very long way. Because if you can't be curious about what works and what doesn't work, if you're afraid of finding out or thinking that you're broken or thinking that this is no way, this is too complicated, then it'll be really difficult to overcome it. Uh, and then uh, and the next thing part is, is that there is a responsibility if you're partnered with two people for both parties to problem solve in this and to come to the table with it, because it's not just one person experiencing this, especially if it's just one body going through menopause. It's not just her body. It's also his experience or her experience alongside of it. And and so you want to be joint and team approached in this. Um, I. Uh, I love it when a couple can just breathe after they've let all of the symptoms out, when they let all of the emotions out of it and think, okay, let's roll up our sleeves and, and see what's next. And realize that you need, honestly, a team. You need a team approach, not just you as a couple, but you need a, you know, a therapist that's helping. You need medical providers checking both of you out. You need to have products that are supporting you in this experience. And again, that's not a terrible thing. It is truly a blessing that we're in an era where this is available to you. Um, and uh, let's take that to our advantage. You mentioned the engagement of other healthcare practitioners. So therapist is important. There may be some underlying health issues that you haven't been attent quite attentive to. So for example, uh, if one partner is experiencing uh, erectile dysfunction, it's the, to the extent that it is a male partner, and he is not willing to attend to this, it may be that that erectile dysfunction is caused by uh, degenerative nerves, and he needs to attend to perhaps diabetes. Uh, perhaps he's let his diabetes get out of control, or maybe he doesn't know he's a diabetic. Same thing with, uh, with women who are experiencing uh, dryness, uh, excessive dryness, could be the skin, could be mucosal surfaces, and they feel I'm not really in menopause. They should be checking their hormone levels, not just 
the reproductive hormones, but thyroid hormones. So there are a lot, there are a lot of things that may be interplaying here. So it's important for that self-care. Mm -hmm. But the, the basis of all of this, if I'm understanding you correctly, is really communicating with your partner about your needs, particularly if you've been in a long-term committed relationship with someone and perhaps you had that wild sex in your 20s and 30s and 40s. And now you're in the latter part of your 40s, early 50s, and you're experiencing this transition called menopause. And your partner's really not aware of all of the things that your body is going through. And it can be a source of frustration, depression, and so forth, but they can't read your mind. You need to be able to have that communication. I, I've, I've heard from folks that, on, that are on second acts. So um, they're in a new relationship. The, there's actually pretty decent communication. They have to communicate because this is a person that didn't grow up with them, that, that didn't have those early years when they were at you know, this you know, exploratory phase of their sexuality. And so the communication tends to go along the lines of, here's what I like, here's what I don't like. We should be doing that throughout our transition in menopause. That's right. Yes. Because we should always be asking ourselves, what do I like? What do I, I call them yucks and yums. And what do I want? Do I not want? What feels good? What doesn't feel good? Uh, and, and also, like, what are, what are some fun places to explore? Again, like we're talking about the expansion of what sexual intimacy is. It isn't just like, oh, well, now I, I need to feel like cuddling is the same thing as having an orgasm. No, but you get to have a, a, a bigger repertoire of things as well. And it, it really does boil down to communication. And it boils down to believing that pleasure is your birthright and your responsibility. And so it takes, if you're partnered with, with two people, you, you both are responsible for your individual pleasure, as well as the pleasure of the couple. It's not just one party's, especially if it, there's predominantly just one person that is experiencing something physically different. It's not on that person to, to change everything or to educate. It's, it's, it's on both to make that happen in attitude and logistics. So menopause and the, and the transition is a shared responsibility and a shared and a shared benefit because there are lots of benefits. I always like to say we should celebrate menopause because it's a time of liberation and a time when we can take take the time mm -hmm. to explore more fun in our sexuality, provided that we have a cooperative partner and a partner that gets where we are at a given place during that transition. So as always, Dr. Juliana, it is a pleasure to have you as our guest on the Love Me Avita podcast. Uh, we hope to have yet more of Dr. Juliana's advice, uh, sagacious advice, and we hope that you will tune in to the Love Me Avita podcast sponsored by Fem Pharma. Juliana, how can they find you? You can uh, also reach out to Dr. Juliana. How can they find you? Thank you. I um, So I am Dr. Juliana Hauser on all social media platforms. And my website is dr-juliana with one N uh, dot com. And I have a newsletter that you can sign up for on my website uh, that I communicate directly uh, to uh, those on the list. So more to come from Dr. Juliana. This is Jerry DiPiano with Dr. Juliana Hauser signing off. And remember to love Mia Vita. Be well.